today we are privileged to host Professor Kapil Kapoor, uh, who is going to speak on the foundations of Indian aesthetics, and he will continue uh, tomorrow in a second session, which is a natural extension of this one. Uh, may I briefly uh, introduce Professor Kapil Kapoor, though he is very well known to a large number of uh, students and uh, scholars in India. I would like still to say that he has been teaching for over 60 years, and he's something of a legend, not only among his numerous students, but also among students and scholars of Indian knowledge systems, of which he has been one of the most important pioneers in India. Generations of his students have been fascinated by his lucid, invigorating, and ever original expositions as a speaker and a writer alike. Of the most abstruse concepts of Indian literature, philosophy, aesthetics, languages, textual studies, and much more. And above all, he has been an unmatched champion of India's intellectual traditions. I will not go over his many official positions uh, that he has held and still his old holding at, uh, at present, but his impact on Indian education has been enormous. Uh, with this, I would like to initiate uh, this um, talk of Professor Kapil Kapoor, which is going to be more in the nature of a conversation by, uh, first of all, reading a small quotation of Sri Aurobindo. I'm sure, Kapilji, you might have seen it. It was written more than a century ago. And it justifies, in a way, Sri Aurobindo was speaking about national education and what national education in India should be. And it justifies, in a way, this whole um, theme of this course, this semester. <coughs> and he wrote, between them, music, art, and poetry are a perfect education for the soul. They make and keep its movements purified, self-controlled, deep, and harmonious. These, therefore, are agents which cannot profitably be neglected by humanity on its onward march or degraded to the mere satisfaction of sensuous pleasure, which will disintegrate rather than build the character. They are, that is, all these art forms, when properly used, great educating, edifying, and civilizing forces. So this was, this was uh, Sri Aurobindo on the importance of art and his complaint that already then that uh, art did not have a proper place uh, in our systems of education. And he was hoping that this would happen after Indian independence, which it has not exactly. But without going into this, uh, I would like to ask you, Kapilji, first of all, for today, what, according to you, because you've been speaking for decades on, on Indian mm aesthetics and arts and, and intellectual traditions. If you could give us the gist, the, 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 the essence of what, how do we define Indian aesthetics? How do, what are its foundations? How get the, they get manifested in Indian arts? Uh, what are its characteristics that make it Indian precisely? This would be my first question to you. Well, first of all, Sabko Namaskar. Sabko Namaskar, and since you are all young, you should be smiling or laughing and not looking so serious. At my age, I am not serious. Uh, I have, I'm very grateful to Daninoji because Daninoji has been a pusher, you know. He has pushed me into, if he had not pushed me for almost uh, three decades now, I think I would have been quite silent and sleeping most of the time. So I'm grateful to the Ninoji for uh, one of the two or three persons, you know, who sort of pushed me into doing these things. Uh, the question, the question, if I get you rightly, is how is Indian aesthetics different? Is that the question? First one. Here's the question, and what, mm -hmm. what are its, its essential is characteristics or principles mm -hmm. or modes of operation? Mm -hmm. What allows us to identify and Indian aesthetics? So that's it. You see, it's like uh, a verb cook appears a simple cook, but it involves so many activities. Washing, cutting, 
putting into a utensil, boiling and all that. So Daninoji's question is as rich as the verb cook. And what all it means. Let me see. Let me say that the starting point, good starting point would be the societal function of art in Indian society. What is the societal function you see in art? And uh, our uh, thinkers, uh, we have had a large number of thinkers uh, before uh, the decline began. I mean, now, now we don't have things. We have translators now, but we had thinkers once. Hmm? And one of them says, that there are four ends of life we all know and uh, you see 20 years ago if i had mentioned those in our own language dharmartha kaam moksha people would start you know saying are yare bhai pravachan shuru ho gaya hai na? but if you translate them into english they begin to make more sense to our uh, people who have been brought up in this uh, english medium education Righteousness. What are the goals of life? Righteousness. Material well-being. Fulfillment of desires. And after all this, a freedom from all this. You have to be a free person. Freedom from all this. Now these four ends of life are there. And the thinker asks, in India, an Indian thinker asks, that for dharma, righteousness, we have Dharma Shastra. We have a long tradition of Dharma Shastra. I'm tempted to just say that we have a tradition. West does not have a tradition in various disciplines, but I will not elaborate on that some other time. Tradition of Dharma, Dharma Sutras, Dharma Shastras, Nibandhas, right up to 19th century. So, for righteousness, dharma, we have dharma shastra. Four ends of life. Look, our numerous are very important. Three paths are there, three paths of life. Jnana, karma, and bhakti. Four ashram, four stages in life. You, you educate yourself. Grihastha, vanaprastha, sannyasa. There are four ends of life. Very neat organization of Hindu life. And uh, you may be or you may not be aware that 70% of Indians still live life like that. You see, with these things. So four ends of life. Dharma ke liye dharma shastra. Arth ke liye arth shastra. Kaam ke liye kama shastra. Or moksha ke liye moksha shastra. Upanishad. Prasthana Trai, na Upanishad, Bhagavad Gita, Brahma Sutra. Prasthana Trai. These are the three texts which are considered crucial if you want to understand Indian philosophy. Upanishads, Brahma Sutra, and Bhagavad Gita, which is a Sangrai, some summing up. So, Charo, four ends ke liye, you have four traditions of Shastras. So, phir ye art kya karta hai, literature kya karta hai? What is its function? Why is it there? Huh? And this is there because it is a drishtant. It exemplifies, it uh, concretizes the ideas of the four kinds of shastras and displays them in the life of an individual. Concrete presents in a manner that people are able to learn from it with pleasure, with some joy, saras, saras arth. If you tell people, somebody asks me a question, what is truth? And I say, well, you read Shandogya. But if, if some small play, play, small natak of, uh, of, uh, you know, Satya Kaam Jabali. Satya Kaam Jabali. Jabali is the son of Satya Kaama, who went to Gautama, said, I want to be your Shishya. He said, okay, 
which family you belong to who is your father not not a patriarchy question just a simple question who is your father which family he said i'll ask my mother and come and tell you tomorrow sir as my mother is jabala and he asks her and she says son i have served so many men in my life i can't tell you who your father is but i jabala am your mother go and tell this to the god to rishi gautama the son goes and says this and gautam says what a great truth teller your mother is and you are even greater because you have not changed even a varna sound of what your mother said you shall be my disciple now this narrative counters a lot of feminist theories counters a lot of misgivings we are mis notions we have wrong notions we have of our ways of thought and ways of thinking along with of course you know because i can see vidya log daughters sitting here prata smarniye panch kanya we have this concept of prata smarniye panch kanya subah subah uth ke reverence ke sath in panch ka naam lijiye and all the five were those who violated the social norms tara kunti mandodari hmm? ahalya and one more tara kunti mandodari ahalya and uh, who else fifth one kunti tara mandodari kunti tara mandodari ahalya draupadi draupadi prata smarane look at your society we say this is anti women and very oppressive here is the society which says these five women are to be remembered in the morning with great reverence because they were women of courage great courage and courage is admired in women that's why i always say it i used to say to my class girls must never cry they should make men cry but they should never cry you know all right so look what is the function of art art concretizes the the thought the ideas the values that the philosophical texts uphold for the society that are explained identified in the text shastron ka shastra ka jo gyan hai shastra gyan ko hum easily access nahi kar sakte we can't because uh, you know uh, the difficulty you have to wrestle with the ideas it's a, it's a very great very terse terse text dense text theek hai so it's the saras so art art is deeply imbricated with in knowledge philosophy in india it has the aim of it aim of transferring transferring knowledge to the ordinary people to the common people maybe to the ordinary people this uh, this is important because uh, sonal man singh ji who is a great dancer you know might have heard of her bharatanatyam she is now more than 78 79 now she has always been arguing that if you want in your education arts should have a very important place as you were arbindo ji also from the quotation he said because she says you start explaining dashavataras dashavataras in prose to people you will take one hour two hours they won't visualize easily understand but when i dance the dashavatara when i dance the dashavataras immediately they are communicated to that so the so art mediates between knowledge and people that is one so that's function now aesthetics as a science does not exist in india we don't have a discipline like aesthetics what is aesthetics aesthetics is the science of perceptible forms जो दिखती हैं जो दिखती हैं चीजें 
उनकी साइंस है परसेप्टिबल फॉर्म्स एंड इट ओरिजिनेट्स इन ग्रीस इन ग्रीस दिस डेफिनेशन एंड दिस साइंस बिकॉज इन ग्रीस ज्योमेट्री इज द की की साइंस की कोर ज्योमेट्री डिटर्मिन्स एवरीथिंग इन द ग्रीक थॉट एंड ज्योमेट्री इज द साइंस ऑफ टेरा फर्मा टेरा फर्मा धरती का यू कैन ड्रॉ लाइन्स कट फॉर्म्स इज नॉट राइट यू कैन कट फॉर्म्स एंड ऑल दैट यू कैन कट रीशेप रीअरेंज यू कैन डिस्ट्रॉय ए प्लॉट ऑफ अर्थ प्लॉट प्लॉट ऑफ लैंड एंड क्रिएट फाइव ट्राइंगल्स आउट ऑफ इट यू कैन रीक्रिएट सो डिस्ट्रक्शन क्रिएशन बट इट इज टेराफॉर्म reality is terra form and therefore perceptible form hard reality but in indian indian thought reality is not terra form it's not what is visible what is quantifiable what is segmentable what is rearrangeable an ancient hymn dirghatamas hymn of dirghatamas is he ancient hymn ban i think mandala 10 rigveda 1 for 145 is the hymn of dirghatamas deep darkness hymn of deep darkness you see and there is an indication here of the theory of creation also there was a time when there was nothing it was all dark darkness right deep darkness in that hymn he says gauri me mai salilani takshati language cuts forms in the ocean of reality for us reality is not terra firma it is ocean reality is like an ocean what is the quality of ocean non separability inseparability you cannot draw lines in a no a water you can't uh, separate the water into pieces water is a continuum and you cannot cut forms but we cut forms in that reality with language wave see huge wave bubble froth now we but the moment we say look at that bubble the bubble is gone back into water so reality is a kind of kind of to in fact not 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 seeking to explain the background and that's like uh, combining vedanta with the shankaracharya's commentary the reality the creation is pulsating matter pulsating matter energized matter this is brahmand pulsating matter it's a pulsating like lava and in that forms arise and forms collapse so forms arise and collapse so then the reality is not terra firma it is ocean and it is the language which cuts forms in that so perceptible whatever is perceptible for us is not necessarily either real or the whole reality jo dikhta hai wo hame zaruri nahi ke sach ho waqai ho aur ya पूरा स, पूरा सच वही हो पूरा सच वही हो तो यू हैव दी प्रतिभाषिक सत्ता जो दिखता है परमार्थिक सत्ता एंड दी तत्वार्थिक सत्ता अब ऐसे जैसे राजशेखर कहते पोइट है ना पोइट पोइट के लिए प्रतिभाषिक सत्ता काफी है वो शुरू प्रतिभाषिक सत्ता से होता है फ्रॉम दी अपियरेंस बट a great poet communicates from that appearance to the core essence of reality to the tatvarthik satta for example he will describe the sun as a ball of fire hanging in the sky ball of fire ball because it looks like a ball of fire hmm? gend lagti hai gend now this is what it looks but when he goes on 
and talks of its energy, its heat, uh, its impact on the plants growing up, hmm? plants growing up. Then he communicates to you the reality which is beyond its appearance as a ball hanging in the sky. Right? So the perceptive, that's why perceptible reality is not the whole reality. And therefore, we don't really have a science of aesthetics. The feature of aesthetics in the Greek tradition is, or, or even in our, I will tell you why, because we, uh, it's, it's a science which deals with beauty, beauty of objects, beauty, and you know, beauty. And beauty, if you have read, and if you have not read, if you have read, you are lucky. If you have not read, you are luckier because you have not unnecessarily taxed your mind. Plato ka ek dialogue has symposium. Symposium. Symposium padhiye. In that, there is Diotima's discourse. Diotima's discourse near the end of that. And Diotima discusses the concept of beauty. What is beauty? And she moves from, she moves from the, the objectified, objectified beauty in what you see to the beauty of uh, appropriateness, the beauty of the material, the beauty of the appropriateness, appropriate and the beauty of appropriateness, appropriateness for goodness, so for goodness. So she moves from she moves from the physical beauty to goodness as beauty, goodness as beauty. Because remember, uh, the Greek definition of beauty is of proportion and design. Proportion and design. Ab, aisa hai ke ek, uh, the Statue of Rhodes, Rhodes Island, जो दो Island उस Aegean Sea में, Island में ऊपर उन्होंने Greeks made a huge road road का statue बनाया, Rhodes statue, huge statue. Now, if you may have some, if you have a 18, 19, 20, 30 story building, 40 stories, then the stories on top, 40th story looks smaller in height than the first that you see before you. Are you getting me? If you look at the building, the building is small, the building is small compared to what you see before you. This is our view defect. Hai. Are you understanding or no? If you look at a big thing, then you look at the building is small, the building is small, the building is small. But if you want to give so, then you make a huge statue. Huge statue. You have to make the upper half longer than the lower half. Then the viewer will see a proper proportion. Naito, ek statue banaya hai, to uska yahan se, mala tange to uski hongi che foot ki, or upar wala hissa dikhega teen foot ka. If, if the artist is a, true to reality, true to reality, then what he creates will be false in appearance. So what he has to do is, he has to falsify the reality to appear true in art. इतनी बढ़िया बात कपिल कपूर के दिमाग की नहीं है ये प्लेटो की बात प्लेटो फिडियास द स्कल्प्टर फिडियास फिडियास द स्कल्प्टर व्हेन ही हैड टू मेक द स्कल्प्चर एंड देन यू नो ही सेज सोक्रेटिस कमेंट दस माय डियर इज ट्रूथ एंड फाल्सुड मिक्स्ड इन आर्ट ट्रूथ एंड फाल्सुड इज मिक्स्ड इन आर्ट a falsehood, okay. Hanuman ji flew across the ocean. Flew across the ocean. Huh? Now this, 
there is a element of truth and there is an element of falsehood he couldn't have couldn't have uh, you know flown across the ocean but he went so fast it was almost like flying now milka singh the flying sikh we accept because it is in english we say flying sikh hai na but if we say hanuman ji ud ke gaye to humko hindi samajh aa gayi hum yaar hai re kya ud ke kaise ja sakte hai na but you see in art truth and falsehood get mixed representation mein pratibhashik satya is enough but a poet must convey the ultimate reality so first of all in indian art and also in i think in greek also you see the it is imbricated with knowledge gyana the only difference is that since the greek tradition was scriptal and ours was oral and our arts our literature are basically performative performative our shravya preksha shravya preksha oral visual hamare art sare oral visual hain so they are orality ke karan they are all performative so in india the arts are not a privilege of the artist they are not privilege of the artist and in fact the artists in india are called craftsmen craftsmen they are kalakar kala kya hai 64 kalaye hain kalakar aaj kal kalakar ka matlab thoda dusra bhi ho gaya na ki bada kalakar aadmi hai ye hai na bada chalu aadmi hai but he is a craftsman he crafts things crafts so you know the the indian artist the art is not art is not a privilege just as knowledge also is not a for the privileged few contrary to the popular impression indian knowledge system is the most democratic system in the world because because all that you require to learn are ears nothing else in the oral tradition murari bapu ko sun lijiye deshanand ji ko sun lijiye danino ji ko sun lijiye hmm? you learn just with your ears but in the scriptal tradition in the written tradition you have to know how to read that and therefore leotard when he says that with computer now we will democratize knowledge he couldn't be farther from truth because to for computer you learn you must learn to read you must learn to write you must learn how to open the computer to operate the computer to search and scroll and to go to the site and so many other so you need so much of learning and skill before you can reach in fact people get tired searching and scrolling for 2 hours and at the end of it they feel they have done lot of work huh? so they deserve a cup of coffee while well, they have reached nothing reached nothing in this in this um, so you've wonderfully defined the societal function of the of the art and the concepts behind but there is also in india a certain instrumentality of the art you know this this uh, twin concept of rasa bhava Uh-huh. which seems to be yeah yeah you see yes yes you know i i i am saying from beauty now beauty in india in indian definitely in our not that we do we don't appreciate beauty not that we don't have beautiful but our concept of beauty is not proportion and design proportion and design i am fond of saying i must have said it last time also that if you ask a small child three year old child that who is the most beautiful person in the home he will say my grandmother because and the grandmother is a toothless beauty huh? but she will say my grandmother because for her beauty consists in love beauty consists in you know affection in in being protective in being good in a in jeevan mulya shemendra says jeevan mulya so beauty in india and uh, that uh, anand kumar swami defined it so beautifully to that to which your mind attaches with reverence in india that to which your mind attaches with reverence is beautiful 
that which to your mind attaches with reverence is beautiful, right? And uh, uh, so, what, what, to what kind of, what kind of thing the mind will attach with reverence? Reverence for what? Reverence for, reverence for, basically human goodness. Human goodness, and uh, human values. Human values. Strong human values. The Shemendra's phrase is Jeevan Mulya. He says, what is the point of very beautiful similes and metaphors and uh, right choice of words and uh, right stone? You see, if 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 you if they don't teach you, what you create does not give you Jeevan Mulya. The values which are necessary for proper life. So you know you can uh, I mean uh, you can uh, you can have marble and you can make a tomb but you can uh, you can you can take marble and you can take a, you can sculpture a saint you can sculpture anything you can sculpture a flower or you can even sculpture a horrible looking creature in marble so the the point is that it is your mind will attach with in reverence with what and that content that content is the substance of indian aesthetics and that content is in terms of what madanyani was saying ras and abhava <coughs> that is everything creates a state of mind in you state of being state of being you know ras ras i uh, may minimally explain that this term it means uh, uh, it can mean uh, essence or juice it can mean uh, uh, you know taste hmm? taste and uh, in uh, many translations people translate it as emotion eliot translated it as sentiments sentiments but i translate it as state of being there are states of being because you say if you are happy eh, so i can't ask uh, one of you okay, where are you happy in your nose or in your ear where are you happy your whole self is happy so it's not that you are happy here or here only emotion or sentiment your whole self your whole self is a person so the rasa is a state of being certain events certain people certain experiences transform you and create a state of being in you state of being now those states of being states of being have been uh, have been uh, synonymized by bharat in his natya shastra taxonomized usne taxonomy bana di hai list bana di hai 50 ki 50 50 states are being of course he has divided them into ras then he has sthayi bhava and then uh, uh, the auxiliary auxiliary bhavas and five six sattvic bhavas and that you see i will come to that a little later he is the classic he has classified them there are the core bhava bhava simply means from the dhatu bhu to be so bhav is a being a being and uh, if when the in the uh, something happens something happens to someone and creates a state of being in him in life ras theory is not only a theory of art it's a theory of life in fact art only reflects life hai na so for example if uh, uh, somebody uh, i'm sorry to give this example but uh, chekhov chekhov's story grief in chekhov's story grief ayana patapov the old cab driver you know he is sitting immobile in his cab and there is snow moscow snow he is not even shaking off his snow he saw him mobile 
and a passenger comes and says, hey, take me to the station. I says, you know, my son died. And the passenger says, everyone has to die. Come on, take me. And then, you know, the second passenger came. After dropping that passenger, he's again sitting in Mumbai. And then somebody comes, hey, will you take me there? He says, you know, my son died. He says, now you want to kill me? Look ahead and drive. These responses he meets. Finally, he tells his story to his horse because nobody listens. As my mother used to talk to herself. And one day I asked her, Ke, BG, BG is in Punjabi. BG is a term for mother. Ke, why do you talk to yourself? She says, I have tried all my life to talk to people, but nobody understands me. So I have started talking to myself. I understand myself. So when nobody listens to your story, you tell it to the horse. Now in that, it is the death of his son, death of a grown-up son. You see, he had been driving a cab, Aina, and he had hoped the son will grow up and he will start driving and then he will, the old man will rest and you know, and the son started driving the cab, but in a month, after a month, he developed some very bad fever and he died. Now death of a grown-up son, young son, is considered a very, very intense kind of tragedy. Intense kind of tragedy. And in that tragedy, now this happens to him. So what is his state? His state is his bhav. His bhav is of grief. Grief, dukkha. Dukkha. And when somebody empathizes with him, empathizes with him, what will he feel for him? Compassion. Karuna. That is a rasa. That is a rasa. You see the difference? Bhava is the experiential state. And Karuna and the rasa is the effect, effect that that state has on the observer, the viewer, the relation, the friend, the parent, the brother, the sister, you see, the karuna, compassion, compassion. Then the question arises whether the experiencer himself can also have compassion. That will be called then self-pity. And that is also a, one of the bhavas there, you see in that. Now, so the whatever is beautiful, is one to which your mind attaches with reverence, goodness. I'll give you a simple example. Suppose you are walking and uh, you see a blind man, you know, trying to cross the road. Hmm. He's just standing and, you know, doing his sticks like this. And people keep on walking. Then a small school child comes, some three, four year old girl, five, get, gets down the bus from the school and she looks at this uncle. And then she catches hold of the stick and takes him across the road. Will you find it beautiful or not? Tell me. You will find it beautiful? Do you understand? So your mind will attach with the reverence and you will be, you will be, it, it, there will be an effect on you. You will be, you know, you will be for the moment become a little more effulgent about human nature, isn't it? Agar, if, uh, on the other hand, if somebody is standing there, that old man, and somebody comes and knocks him down, knocks him down, doesn't care, and knocks him down, and then moves on, you will have another kind of feeling. You will have disgust, isn't it? You will have disgust. So, experience, something happens to someone, it creates a state in that person in life and the viewer of viewer, the effect on him is, I have to put the card, yeah, and the, 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 the effect on the person, other person, is, a, is his own state. You see, sthai bhava, what is sthai bhava? A kind of stable 
state of being stable. Why some are called only eight or nine are called sthai bhavas. And then there are sanchari bhavas, auxiliary, there are sattvic bhavas, there are vibhavas. Then why these eight sthai stable bhavas? You know, like dukkha, uh, prayasa, prayasa, hmm? krodha, huh? these are sthai. These sthai stable bhavas are those which everybody experiences. Everyone, you know, uh, falls in love. And maybe more than once. If you, some people who are lucky may consider that fortunate, and some may consider that unfortunate. And the same way, everybody suffers, have some kind of suffering, experience of suffering. And these Thai Bhavas, when they happen to somebody, they last a long time. A deep wound, ghav aapke andar, koi lage, dukh, ghav lage, to wo samay ke saath heal nahi karta. Uska dukh badta jata hai. Samay ke saath, with the passage of time, that that uh, that uh, that uh, suffering it deepens it doesn't heal it deepens so these are sthai bhava some core i think uh, uh, edmund burke he didn't list them but he called these core experiences of human life as global human conditions global human conditions these are human conditions and they are they, they happen because by virtue of the fact that we are all human beings. In fact, jiva, you can see them happening to animals also, even animals. You see, I have seen, I have seen cow a cow crossing with a calf a road, and the calf being hit by a vehicle, and the cow standing there, and tears come flowing from her. I've seen that myself. I've seen a pair of bullocks drawing a bullock cart in summer, overloaded, and one of the bullocks, out of sheer tiredness and thirst, falls down. Then the man opens the other bullock, takes him a little way and ties it. And that bullock turns back, looks at that other friend of his who was drawing, and there are tears falling. It's a by when we say human condition, ye jeev ki condition hai. feeling self. Jahan bhi feelings hai, wahan pe hai. So this is a and a goodness. Ye to ho gaya. Now, jeevan mulle bhi ho gaya. now the question is: you see, in art, in art, what is the difference between art and life? What is the difference between a somebody actually you know, losing somebody in life, actually losing somebody in life, and then somebody watching all that and writing a story about it, like Chekhov. Ayana Patapov, he must have imagined or seen somebody, and then he creates a story. The difference between art and life, the difference between art and life, is the difference of abhinay, enactment. In life it happens, in art you enact what happens. In life somebody suffers, somebody writes a play. Like Dasharath actually died out of suffering when his favorite son left for exile. He died. But Valmiki wrote Ramayana. And he created a character, Dasharat. Valmiki's Ramayana also is an enactment of the experience of suffering, suffering of separation. Separation, eh? uh, in uh, uh, Hitopadesha, there is a small narrative of Kondinya. Kondinya loses his son, and Kondinya is a very wise Brahmin, but he moans. And he cries, hmm? and he's, he has no other feeling except one of, you know, suffering. And then the narrator says, Kondinya, why do you mourn? Separation is the law of life. 
we like like pieces of timber in a mountain stream scene imagine karo like pieces of timber in a mountain turbulent mountain stream we come together and part again this is the law of life then why do you mourn why do you mourn now valmiki when he enacted dasharath's suffering in words his success his success as an artist will lie in how much of that original suffering he is able to capture and communicate in words so there is the dukha of the experiencer and there is the dukha of the representer jo only represent kar raha hai and then the third level is that in a ram leela ram leela huh the village washerman plays the role of dasharath huh and his text is the valmiki text he has not the dasharath valmiki text now he has to through the valmiki text he has to reach dasharath's suffering dashrath suffering and his success will lie in making people cry when people cry cry at the sorrow of dashrath ha huh? then he is successful uh, fielding english novelist 18th century has a novel 19 18th century i think 1819 to be sure he has a novel tom jones tom jones mein in those days there was a very great shakespearean actor very great shakespearean actor garrick 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 g a r r i c k garrick and uh, they have gone both Pat uh, tom jones and his friend patridge two of them they go and watch a shakespeare play hamlet they want they want they pray they they uh, they watch the play hamlet hamlet and then they coming back uh patrick says oh that person performed the gertrude's character so well acted that so well and uh, so man acted the ghost great great actor so he is praising various actors and then tom jones says but garrick garrick's enactment of hamlet acting his acting was superb he said what is the acting there anybody who loses his father will act will act like that so the success of garrick as an actor was that people didn't think he was acting people thought he was experiencing so when uh, uh, who is that man who played uh, played uh, ben hur and also moses that character he finally he played them moses and ben hur and uh, you know he, and in bible also he played he played them so sincerely that finally he became a monk and went to the monastery went to the monastery so you see the difference between life and art is of enactment and in in uh, in art as i said there is the original experience there is the representing experience and there is the enacting experience and then the fourth level is i watch the ram leela i watch that washerman as dasharatha and he plays it so well like garrick that i also cry i am an audience i know it is all make believe it is all make believe there is no real dasharatha here no ram here no no valmiki here and yet i cry yet i cry i will remind you of the film aradhana 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 there is a story about there was sharmila tagore and rajesh khanna long back huh? rajesh khanna is a pilot and they fall in love and you know they marry in a temple then they plan to do, because he has a flight next day he is a fighter pilot so he they plan to get uh, get get back home and then formally get married but they build a temple but next day his flight crashes and he dies now the girl she is with a child and she doesn't abort the child 
she gives birth to the child she leaves her family gives birth to the child and puts the child in an orphanage and remains around watching who will adopt that child then she goes as a servant in the family where that son is adopted and 21 years she remains a servant there watching the son grow up and her ambition is that he should become like his father a pilot now in between after 18 17 years when that boy falls in love with the girl that girl also comes that girl notices the great attachment at the same time a disinterestedness of this old woman who is now old for the boy and she realizes that she is not a servant she is the real mother so she takes care of her then one day when that boy becomes a pilot and his first landing he has to pass the test she takes the old woman sharmila tagore now white hair and she takes her to the airfield she is standing just behind a door and then at the air ka a fighter lands and comes to a halt the canopy opens and a young man comes out with his helmet gets down and walks and he walks exactly like the father and at that moment you see that woman is crying and even now i am moved in those days i used to cry and my daughter used to say papa jaldi aao tumhara rone wala scene aa raha hai that jaldi jaldi aao you will miss that scene because you have to cry i used to cry now look at this we people are so selfish that we see only our own suffering we ha jaate hain kahin ab bada bura hua ji yes very bad it is how sad you know how sad i i hope you will get over it and all that we don't really feel the suffering of others we only feel we think our dukha is the greatest hmm? nobody else has that kind of dukha but in that moment in that moment kapil kapoor who cries at the suffering of a woman unrelated to him he is he, he participates the suffering of that woman becomes his own suffering his own suffering and it is so contrary to my narrow lower self that for that moment i am become larger than myself i am nobler than i am because i am crying at the other person's dukha so i have become art has made me noble elevated enlarged for the moment and that is what abhinav gupt says is the abhinav gupt says is the effect of art satva udrek prakashamay satva udrek satva ka rise hota hai satva ka and prakasham everything becomes effulgent you become effulgent you become effulgent this is the effect of art so thank you, thank I, you. I, i have to um uh, first of all to thank you uh, for reminding us of the true meaning of art it is so important art as the enactment of the whole of life the whole of human experience ultimately uh, we we will continue this tomorrow very much because we have more to explore